One, two, three, clap! Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Audrey. Hello everyone! And Cara. Hello! And I'm your host, Finn. In this episode, we're going to be visiting Earth-616, donning spandex and punching villains in Marvel Crisis Protocol, then travelling back to near the beginning of human history to experience the struggles of humankind in Paleo, before finishing with architecture during the Carolingian Empire. What have you been up to, Audrey? Uh, I've been... I've been to a lot, actually, because uh, I wasn't there at last recording, so I can do a catch-up on all the holiday season. So, uh, as our listeners don't know, but you guys know, I got married uh, during the the winter break. Uh, Married uh, during the the winter break, uh, which was a a great occasion. And we did that in the family. Uh, Winter weddings aren't very conventional, but that was to group all the celebrations together. Uh, we partied a lot for New Year's Eve. Well, actually, we didn't party, but we played games. We uh, we partied a lot for New Year's Eve. Well, actually, we didn't party, but we played games. We played uh, It's a Wonderful Kingdom. We played uh, the end of the Eon's End Legacy campaign. And we played the Vampire Heritage uh, Masquerade game as the Standard Game as the Standalone Rules. And I can already say that the rulebook is a bit messy, but you can get to it. And uh, I also did a bit of painting, so maybe people saw my bust, which I posted on Instagram. Uh, at the very big, I was very happy to finally finish. Yeah, it's a nice piece, and uh, it's always great to actually just finish a project to be like done. Yeah, I wanted to have it done uh, in 2021, but Destiny said no, it's 2022. But for two or three days, it still counts as a 2021 project. (laughs) (laughs) For me, uh, what about you, Kara? Uh, Well, first of all, a happy new year to everyone. And um, I hope 2021... uh, No, wait, what year do we have now? 2020. I uh, forgot to say that. Happy New Year, everyone. It's kind <laughs> of the endless 2020 going on and on. Yeah. Yes, Just hope this year will feel like a new year, actually. And um, so for me, oh, I, I just checked, I think, like in October, I w- was in the last recording. Um, so a lot has happened. Um, I actually got around to play a lot of games with students, with my... Uh, tries to establish a board game club at school um, which was a lot of fun and also to see students like in a different setting and doing different things than normally and um, that was pretty great i did apparently manage to overcome some health problems um, at least since like two weeks i actually have energy to do things um which I hadn't for several months now. Um, apparently, vitamin deficiency is a bad thing for you. So I heard so. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a kicker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, for me it all started pretty well. I'm uh, having my own project that's not board game related of establishing an aquarium at my home. Um, Ooh, what what fish? Establishing an aquarium at my home. Um, Ooh, what what fish are you going for? Um, no fish, uh, axolotls. Ooh. Okay, oh fair enough. I was I was all set to talk about tropical fish, which I grew up with a lot of those. As my father used to kill a lot of tropical fish. Um, my father used to kill a lot of tropical fish um, through not looking after them properly. But axolotls. Yeah. So this your story kind of t- turned bad there, but. <laughs> I, I still love them. Uh, I love them when I go to pet stores. But I look at them and I go, yeah, maybe somebody more responsible who wasn't, you know, didn't have a father who fish, but yeah. maybe just loves the idea of them more than actually having them. Yeah. I mean, I'm am thinking about actually adding fish to the tank. Um, though the problem with axolotls is that either they see it as food or it sees them as, as food. So um, everything that fits in their mouth is food and there is 
a predator for them. So, um, but apparently, um, I, guppies, you know, these standard fish tank fish. Oh, yes. They reproduce quite fast. So there are people that say, yes, you can keep them together with Axolot, provide a nice addition to their um, um, food. So basically that's breeding the food in the same environment that yes. uh, the actual, uh, I would say decoration, even though the Axolot are not exactly decoration, but the pets. Yes. Pretty food. Yes. Very pretty. So um, I'm thinking about that. as a biologist, I have learned to never put predator and prey together in one enclosed environment. So it's kind of, ah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's my big uh, project for the start of the new year. Well, it's always nice to have some pets around the place, especially quiet ones. Yeah. Speaking <laughs> of someone who doesn't own, uh, it's often a competition, which one's noisier. Um, it's the birds most of the time, but the dog, if she sees one of her friends, is uh, the loudest thing you've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah our our yeah. cat uh, is not a very noisy cat, but he can get really noisy when he wants something. A cat, but he can get really noisy when he wants something and we are not giving that thing. Like, he goes into the corridor and... If he goes to that spot, it's always the same spot, of course, and start meowing, I know that it's either time to open a cupboard so that he can visit it, or just play. Yeah, my, uh, my mother... That it's either time to open a cupboard so that he can visit it, or just play. Yeah, my uh, my mum never kept any noisy cats, uh, although I don't know her newest cat too well, because um, I've never met her. She's a little uh, palico called Poppy. Aww. Oh. Yeah, I've, uh, she did not like the New Year's fireworks. Yeah, Pam was very upset with them. Um, she did not enjoy it at all either. I mean, the birds, the birds didn't care. That's actually pretty interesting. Here in Germany, um, we have a lot of discussion about fireworks because due to COVID, um, the sale of fireworks in Germany was uh, banned. So everyone who wanted to do fireworks just, you know, cross the border and bought their fireworks in neighboring countries um, because only the sale, not the usage was uh, forbidden. Um, but it did spawn a lot of discussion about whether it's responsible to sell and use fireworks, private land, also regarding pets. Um, because that's probably something most dog or cat owners can relate to that uh, they do not like fireworks. No, no, Pam gets very distressed over them. Guess but, what? Uh, my, my... my cat is at that and he's meowing. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to go up and back up the Ah, well, I guess... Anyway, uh, Fen, what did yeah. you do recently? <laughs> That's what <laughs> I was just about to just take hold of that. Thank you for asking. <laughs> um, that, thank you for asking. Um, well, uh, first of all, as we s as we sit and talk right now, in about two or three days, I'm going to have Obsession arriving, which if you've not uh, heard of it at all, it's a, I think, 2018 board game, uh, essentially Pride and Prejudice style, Pride and Prejudice style you play a destitute family whose terrible reputation no money awful tiny small house i mean there's barely got five like rooms and five servants you know well 50 rooms and five servants you know everyone looks down on you and uh, you've got to get yourself back up the social ladder by holding events and it's um it's um it, it's a fantastic game uh this is the third printing and i've finally managed to get a copy with the expansions and some of the extra bits and pieces so i'm really excited about that because i do so love a bit of um upstairs downstairs or uh you know the, the other pride and prejudice of course and everything it's awesome and everything it's um it's kind of a fun period to make fun of and this game is one of the few ones that's not just a card game it's got a bit more to it it's a very kind of almost an economic euro so i'm a bit excited about that i've got a mystery package arriving from turkey i i i it must be a kickstarter but i don't know no kickstarter told me hi we're shipping from turkey or anything so i've got no idea that's due to arrive on uh two days from now as well so both of those um 
but uh, I've mostly been. We just had like a, uh, I think he quite liked it. Um, none of us did. Uh, it was a bit frustrating, and I love the look of it. I love the concept of it, but as far as a dexterity pushing kind of game goes, it, it felt like it needed a bit more time in the oven. The components from us. Once the game ended, everyone was like, "Is that it? Is that is is that it?" Uh, so. I don't know. Um, I think it may. We're going to try it with some of the younger cousins and everything when they come over. It may be better fit with them, but I'd almost call it more a toy than a board game. Um, so, if you're looking for a good dexterity game, I so if you're looking for a good dexterity game, I just recommend like Flick 'em Up or Crokinole or um, something along those lines. Like some of the balancing games, Men of Work, Men at Work, and Meeple Circus. Meeple Circus is a delight. So. I can recommend uh, Flick of Faith. Ooh, that's uh, I, Faith. Ooh, that's uh, I actually played that a lot of with students, and um, like in the la the last day of school, I uh, with one of my classes, I just took out my board game and said, you know, just choose one and and play. And a group of four students picked this and played it for two hours straight, several rounds, and then. And, play and a group of four students picked this and played it for two hours straight several rounds and they had a blast um, and it were uh, uh, ninth graders so around 16 15 years old yeah yes so around 16 15 years old yeah, I just look at it now. It looks it looks better, and I assume you flick the pieces onto the board. Yeah, that's the problem with Kabuto is you're supposed to do a controlled push from behind until it's fully onto this onto the area, and it's just impossible to to get that right because the it, the things steer all over the place. They get hung up and everything. I much prefer flicking games. So, uh, flick of faith sounds pretty pretty interesting. As an agility game, I saw the last. I think maybe two years here and there in the French community talks about flying. Ooh. <laughs> I wonder what that's called in English. It's not flying goblin. I very quickly tried to look for it as soon as you said flying goblin. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah you... I, I, I love a game like that. It's a it's a game from Yellow. Ah, uh, I'll be. I'm not going to look for it now. I'll have a look for it later. That sounds uh, that sounds interesting. Yeah, and uh, the goblins have like little helmets. That sounds great. Uh, and uh, we also play Great Western Trail, which I gotta say is fantastic. But um, for people who don't play a lot of board games, it's uh, slow going at first. Um, however, um, both 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 the the um, both 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 the the in-laws parents said that they thought the board layout was fantastic and they could understand what was going on once they got to mechanics it was very clear to them which was great because they've not played a heavy euro like that before i was a little concerned it, it's just we had to call the game it, it's just we had to call the game before we got properly to the end um, but you know, everyone had a very good time, and I still think that's fantastic. And it's made me like I've got to play Maracaibo. It's it's sat on my shelf. I keep looking at it, going, I need to play this, and not getting around to it. So that's that's most of what. Uh, what so that's that's most of what uh, what we did literally since uh, for me since the last recording, which wasn't that long ago, and that was um, mostly play board games. And there's no snow anymore. It's all gone. We've got fog instead. I'm not sure that's better. No, um, the local news. No, um, the local newspaper actually called it mist, which is um, that's basically the heaviest kind of term they could have used to describe a fog here. So it was really. In French, when it's very thick, we say puree de pois, which basically means peas puree. <laughs> oh, um, in the the English name. You know how English is with borrowing everything from anywhere. I think yeah. in Germany we just say like thick mist instead of mist. You know, we, we just add an 
Uh, well, um, and so with all of that, I think it's time for us to cowls for some superhero hijinks with the Marvel Universe version of Audrey. Yes, we are talking about Marvel Crisis Protocol. It's been a while since I wanted to talk about it, and finally uh, we get to it. So first of all, what is Marvel Crisis Protocol? It's a skirmish game, so that's a game where you don't have tons and tons between four and six, generally. And you end up chucking lots of dice in that one to decide the actions that will be done. So the idea is that you have missions, one blue, one red, and the two teams will have to bring objective points depending on the missions. Missions can be controlling objectives, holding token on a character for as long as possible because you score like one point for each turn uh, one of your characters is holding that token and punching each other in the face i mean why not using lasers to punch the other one or using magic to punch the other one there are lots of variety of ways to punch the others and not necessarily in the face so each team has the possibility to be part of an affiliation you have to have uh, at least the, the half of your team that is part of abilities and the abilities are called by the leader. For instance, leaders of the Avengers are Captain America and Iron Man. Ah, exactly, the leaders of the Avengers are Steve Rogers and Iron Man, because if there is another Captain America that comes later, but he's not Steve Rogers, there's another Captain America that comes later, but he's not Steve Rogers, he doesn't get to use the ability. Names matter in the game. Especially when you have three different Spider-Man. Only three? Peter Parker Spider-Man, Peter Parker Ultimate, um, Peter Parker Spider-Man, Peter Parker in the game. Especially when you have three different Spider-Man. Only three? Peter Parker Spider-Man, Peter Parker Ultimate, um, Pe Peter Parker Spider-Man, Peter Parker Amazing Spider-Man, and Miles Morales Spider-Man. There is also Spider-Gwen and a Rescult of Peter Parker Man, Peter Parker Amazing Spider-Man and Miles Morales Spider-Man. There is also Spider-Gwen and a Rescult of Peter Parker Spider-Man, but they don't really count as Spider-Man, since one has the same rules as the other one, as just the Rescult. So no Spider-Ham yet? No, no, I, I'm, I'm waiting for it. <laughs> between two, for for instance, Okoye from the Wakanda, or uh, Black Widow. And it can go up to six for Hulk. No, Hulk is five and Thanos is six. But the heavy eaters are uh, in the... Some teams have more characters with less points, some teams have less character with more points. So you will have the... Um, the, the playground no not the playground ah the battle zone which is delimited it's a three feet by three feet many people recommend using a uh, play mat so that it's easier to see with your eyes where you fight and where you are not fighting where it's out of borders and you have to put the objectives on it depending to the cards and then you put terrain pieces on it the core box terrain that is enough for any game you might want to play. Extra pieces of terrain are just because, oh, I want the construction site. Oh, I want the building. But you don't have to uh, get more buildings than is in the core box. And that's what I like about the game. You have everything you need to play in the core box. Really, you don't need more in the core box. Really, you don't need more. The rules are just an excerpt in the core box, but the full rules are available online. You have everything. You have the rule, the the, oh, the distance measurements, the dice. You have everything, and so oh, the distance measurements, the dice. You have everything, and so you set up your uh, your board, you set up your terrain, you set up your objectives, and then you set up your heroes. You deploy them. You have to deploy them in a certain range from the border. And the thing is that in this game, if the base is in that beginning zone, it's okay. You don't have to be fully in the beginning zone to start, so you can already be ahead to go from, for the objectives. 
And that can be very useful with characters with a large base size. As they are much more first just with the, the fists, generally the basic attacks which are either fists, so physical or energy or magical. And the thing is that in the game, every time a character takes damage, for any reason, they get a point of power. And then they get to use that point uh, of power to it is because of course the basic attack doesn't cost power. And so, uh, to me, it really feels like uh, in a movie, uh, any movie of superhero, when they start really by just punching each other and tossing a few things uh, at each other, and at the end they get really angry and they use the big superpower thing, a few things uh, at each other, and at the end they get really angry and they use the big superpower thing. And you really feel that uh, increase in intensity of the fight over time. And I think that's one thing that makes it very funny because the first two rounds you're just watching at each other, maybe Captain America is tossing his shield. The first two rounds you're just watching at each other, maybe Captain America is tossing his shield once or twice to see what he can do, etc. And then you go deep and you take out two enemies in a row and that's very fun because you really have that build up of, uh, of tension. Many characters, all but many, have the abilities to toss terrain. So the terrain has have sizes. It goes from one to uh, from for a small uh, dumpster to five for the Sanctum Sanctorium, the building where Doctor Strange lives, and you can toss them at each other. Of course, wait, wait the whole the whole building. Uh, to toss a building of and she Hulk and play a special card that says Hulk and she Hulk can toss. A size 5 building. <laughs> M men, most characters can toss size 2 or size 3 things. Size 3 is a car. Okay. But, uh, no, size 3 is a small building, actually. Si cars are size 2. Okay. Ah, I should have made better notes. <laughs> but, yeah, for the building size 5, you need to have Hulk and She-Hulk teaming up together. And... That's very funny because, of course, when that happens, the terrain is destroyed. So you have to take it out of the board. You can't use it ever again. But yeah, you can say that's a, a small car at Dr. Octopus. Yes, you can. Great. Yes. Um, and so the game first uh, appeared in the summer 2019. Uh, and since then... God, I count with my figures. Ah. And uh, so since then, we have seen many, many, many teams appear. And um, the miniatures have all grown up in quality over time. And the, la the last ones are really great. The first ones in the core box, I won't, I won't say meh because... No, they, they were still good for uh, hard plastic miniatures. But they were lacking a bit in... Um, details and in ease of assembly just a bit but uh the latest ones which were uh there was the hulk uh there was the hulk buster among them um miss marvel they are really well i would not say work of art because that would be just a bit much but they are really easy and convenient to assemble uh, less gaps compared to the core box the to assemble uh, less gaps compared to the core box, the, the, the keys as well for putting the, the, the arms in the proper places, in the shoulders, etc. are much better. And so I like the game, I have to get and so I like the game, I have to get better at the rules outside of just using the core box stuff uh, because I have all, almost all the miniatures that exist for it, including the official terrain. I like a few uh, terrain parts, but I mostly paint and I, my, my goal for 2022 is to finish painting the core box heroes and villains, of course, as soon as possible and play at least two games with the core box and then start building up outside of it because I want to play Angela so bad. Mm. So, yeah. That is hey, a you lot. got Lockjaw? Yeah, I have Lockjaw. Goodbye. Oh, he's such a good boy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm. I, I was clicking through while you were talking about. It. I was looking at all the pictures because I realised I've seen Modok multiple times, and I hadn't realised he was from Marvel Crisis Protocol because a lot of people have painted. And I hadn't realised he was from Marvel Crisis Protocol because a lot of people have painted that big-headed looking weirdo and posted up in various yeah, places. Yeah, Modok was one of uh, the first uh, miniatures uh, to get uh, to get out with uh, after the, the core box with Hulk, Venom, the Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, they were part, and the Asgard. They were part of the first uh, waves, let's say. And more recently, we've had the convocation affiliation with Clea, uh, a second Doctor Strange, uh, Bar- Baron Doctor Voodoo uh, Hood. And it, it's really interesting as well. And I'm discovering some heroes, rediscovering some. For instance, uh, Mordo. For, uh, which is in the Doctor Strange movie, but uh, has not a minor role in it, but not a very big one. And his miniature is super cool. And in the miniature, he uses what I guess is. It. So it gives uh, a different insight as well on the movies. M- most of the time, the miniatures are based from the comic books. The, the way they are designed are based on the comic books, but of course the MCU is also based on the same comic books, so there are uh, some places. Yeah, they seem to be mostly based on the 616 Earth, which is the comic book Earth. I can't remember the number for the movie one, but it's something crazy like 19999 or something like that. Um, but yeah, I, I was just having a good time looking through these as one of the guys I used to work with back when these is one of the guys I used to work with back when I lived in the UK was a huge comic book fan and um, he'd had, you know, he'd bring him into work and leave him around the place. So I kind of flick through them all. And it's, it's in, the poses in particular are incredible how dynamic they've gone with these. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, I love the, yeah. Like, I, I love the Jean Grey uh, miniature. Uh, the um, crocodile is great. Omega Red is just awesome. And we have two 10 centimeters almost uh, miniatures with Dormammu and uh, the Hulkbuster. And the almost uh, miniatures with Dormammu and uh, the Hulkbuster. And the mm-hmm. Hulkbuster is wonderful. Yeah, I was flicking through. I, I was really hoping to see, and I, I didn't think I would, but I was hoping to see Citizen V. Um, uh, one of the other versions of Citizen V before he dresses up as Citizen V is in there, but uh, up as Citizen V is in there, but uh, uh, I assume they'll get to the Thunderbolts maybe sometime in the future. Yeah, for now, um, most Ask miniatures from what I've seen, uh, there is Howard the Duck, uh, Spider Ham, uh, Nightcrawler, and of course Professor E, which are coming out in February, but we are still waiting from Prof. X. Uh, Fantastic Four, of course, are often asked for. Mm-hmm. And then uh, lots of other more minor heroes that I don't remember much of. I think I've seen Squirrel Girl being asked for. Minor hero? She's amazing. No, I'm not saying she's not amazing, but she has less um, publicity. I'm, I'm, I'm talking minor in terms of publicity. Um, yeah. I mean, in my cupboard, I have Omega Red, but I don't have any idea who that is. <laughs> and he's sold just by himself. <laughs> and he's sold just by himself, so I could totally have skipped it. Don't tell. God, I'm totally losing my, my nerd st- street cred here. <laughs> I mean, I've watched the whole MCU, not just the movies, but also the, all the, the, the TV shows uh, on Netflix and the TV shows uh, on Netflix and the ones on Amazon Prime. And I thought, yeah, sure, Marvel, Marvel I, I, I know my stuff. And now I looked through it and so many characters I didn't know. And uh, yeah, so, um, it's, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, only they came pre-paint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they don't even come built. Yeah, yeah. The old Whiz Kids line came pre-painted, but the models were terrible compared to these. Yeah, the, the models they look really great. And also, one thing I just know for a couple minutes now, I've been trying to find a picture of the contents of the core box, and it's actually quite hard because. 
all the people who share pictures show their awesome painted stuff and uh, their individual setups and with additional buildings and structures and whatnot. So it's actually structures and whatnot. So it's actually quite hard to just find plain picture. Hey, what do you get when you buy this core box? Um, um, oh, when, I, when you I, get the core box, I have my core box in my hand. You have ten, okay, great. ten character miniatures with Doctor Octopus, uh, Captain Marvel, Ultron, Spider. Okay, ten, great. Ten character miniatures with Doctor Octopus, uh, Captain Marvel, Ultron, Spider Man, Crossbones, which is a character that I don't know shit about. Oops, sorry. He uh, was in. Um, he he was in the Marvel movies. He's involved, you know, in um, when the building gets blown up in Civil War. That I think that's crossbones there. If bones there, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, but barely use. For, for me, I, I see him. I think Bane in Batman, so that's not really the same. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I get that totally. Then we have Red Skull, Black Widow, Baron Zemo, which we know more about now that there was the uh, Falcon and Winter Soldier uh, series. Zemo's the best. Zemo rules. Yeah, and I saw and so in the series when he took that purple mask out and put it on, I was like, oh. And then we have Iron yeah. Man and Captain America. So of course there are the ten bases, and then you have the terrain, which is one daily bugle stand, which is the size free thing, I think. Uh, two cars, two dumpsters, two traffic light, two lampers, twenty team tactic cards, which are extra abilities that you can trigger with power. Some of these tactic cards require specific heroes to be used, like the Hulk and She Hulk smash big building. Uh, there is also in the A Force team one that I enjoy quite a lot, which has special delivery. It says that any A Force Force team one that I enjoy quite a lot, which has special delivery. It says that any A Force uh, character with flight can move and they she hulk with her. <laughs> And then you have map cards, which I put tokens here, put buildings here, affiliation card, the character stat card, and then the crisis card, tokens here, put buildings here, affiliation card, the character stat card, and then the crisis card, which are the, the missions, and then you have the movement, the range tools, the rulebook, and the 10 dice. And so now to see, so the daily bugger stand is size 3, and the cards are size 2. Like with uh, how Atomic Mass games uh, do the things is that most characters are sold two by two. Big ones are generally sold individually. But uh, so if you want to make yourself a roster, which you will use for tournaments, etc., you generally have uh, it's ten characters maximum in a roster. Buy the core box if you want to. That being said, with the amount of terrain that there is in the core box, it's a pretty good investment if you don't want to buy tons of terrain because you have the terrain, you have the, uh, the, the 10 uh, basic heroes and you have the tokens, um, the crisis cards, etc. which are a good, way to get, a good way to get started. But then, when you want to expand on it, you can buy these 5 or 6 boxes with the heroes that you want to make your roster with and be done. The uh, range and measurements tool, they are also sold individually. Dice, sold individually. So you can really also sold individually. Dice, sold individually. So you can really make up your own uh, box, literally. And that's something that I think is great. Uh, from Atomic Mass Games, really letting people do that. Or buying a core box together, you are two people, you buy the... Buying a core box together, you are two people, you buy the core box, you split the characters, but you can buy again just the uh, measurement tools, etc. And I think that's really great. As well, I mentioned that when you put your characters on the, on the mat, you can put them within, free, uh, within the distance of the edge. When they move, it's also if the base has a contact at the uh, beginning point and a contact at the end point with the movement tool, it's fine, it works. You don't have to fully inside, blah, blah, blah. No, no, if it touches, it's fine. If you're using a beam attack and you use a beam template, if a character has a base that is just slightly overlapped by uh, the, uh, the range tool, the, the, uh, the character is being hit by the beam. It's really simple to measure the stuff in the game and at any time you have the authorization to measure thing but if you declare the attack you can't measure to get sure that it works after that's the only exception 
Okay, and so uh, basically, if if I would buy this box, um, it's it's not like with other games that I have upgrade cards and stuff like. It's just like the character, and the character has special abilities. So I just pick my characters for my team. Um, so you can y yes, and a bit no, because uh, every uh, extra character box that uh, arrives has a few extra. Uh, Crisis or tactic cards. More generally, it's, cra it's tactic cards. But uh, if, for instance, if you buy uh, the box with, uh, and uh, I think it's Valkyrie, the tactic cards that you will have with them are maybe one a generic card and one an Asgard specific card. So if you buy the Asgard, the full Asgard team, you will have all the Asgard cards that they can use. You don't find an Asgard card in an X Men box. And I will be honest, if I would, if I were to play with someone at some point and they tell me, oh, I want to use that tactic cards, but that would force me to buy uh, a 50 euro box with two heroes that I don't care about, I would say, oh, fine, proxy it. <laughs> but, but you don't... <laughs> but, but you don't proxy the models. But if you want to proxy one card, yeah, fine. Yeah, better make sure they look good on the table, but uh, the rest is okay. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, I'm pretty happy uh, to to buy more. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm pretty happy uh, to to buy more uh, miniatures of Marvel heroes, and I have my pre-order for the next batch, which is going to be Gambit and Rogue, uh, Colossus, the Juggernaut, Magic, so that there are S.H.I.E.L.D. stuff coming soon. R rumors are of Nick Fury and uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and a Quinjet. So if you want to have Hulk and She-Hulk tossing a Quinjet at someone, that's coming probably in spring. And I really hope I won't have love Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So um, <laughs> if I had some friends who had uh, this game, I would be really tempted to say, okay, yeah, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is awesome. Let's get some of those. But uh... Yeah, with the S.H.I.E.L.D. there is a high probability that Core Box and the next S.H.I.E.L.D. box would be enough. S.H.I.E.L.D. box would be enough to play. So you can make a roster with Avengers and S.H.I.E.L.D. Uh, stuff. Generally, it's good to have two affiliations in the groups of, in the roster of 10 characters so that you can adapt yourself to an opponent. Yeah, and if you're concerned about the painting, uh, I think Sarastro's pretty much done almost... An opponent. Yeah, and if you're concerned about the painting, uh, I think Sarastro's pretty much done almost all of the models with a little painting video on YouTube. Uh, not almost all, because I think he would need to have days that last like three days to have enough time to paint and film and <laughs> uh, edit and everything. So, uh, so uh, yeah, but I got myself during the holidays the Sanctum Sanctorium because I just love that house and I do plan to follow the Sorastro um, tutorial with a few twists to make it more mine let's say uh, yeah. he, he really has great videos some on some character he has just that's a small just uh, PDFs I think he has for the oh the go green goblin I think uh, and toad I think at least these two are PDFs. Yeah, I, I, so I guess, you know, he's done at least 20 videos. Yeah. So there are a few of them, so it's a pretty good at uh, helping you have confidence in your painting and, you know, fast techniques and good ones. Yeah, yeah, really, a really great way to get uh, started into it. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's probably all the time at uh, the moment we have for like uh, our spandex uh, superheroes. At uh, the moment we have for like uh, our spandex uh, superheroes. Um, so let's go on to something which uh, Grack or Captain Caveman would be just as comfortable playing. Uh, Kara, tell us all about Paleo. Yeah, so Paleo came out in 2020 and um, something to show the German. Um, something to show that Germans still can do good board games. Um, <laughs> and it's a technically two to four player cooperative game with a solo variant. Um, so don't be as confused as I was when you uh, think, hey, solo game and you get a box and it says two to four players. Um, 
it is one to four with a variant for one player. So in the game, you play Stone Age people. Uh, you play a tribe of people who simply, you know, do what Stone Age people did. Grumpf. Go around, scavenge for resources, uh, hunt mammoths and stuff like that. Though with uh, the whole hunting mammoths thing, um, there is some uh, problems with when the game is actually uh, placed in the timeline. But um, yeah, so concept is um, you start with uh, small groups of hunters, gatherers, um, and you have a deck of cards. This deck basically just tells you what you can find and encounter in the wilderness. Um, you divide the deck um, equally around as if you play solo, you have the whole deck to yourself. And then um, each round is you take up the top three cards without looking at uh, their front side and have to decide which of those cards you basically visit. Um, the cards do uh, which can give you a hint on what you can encounter. For example, there are cards that have a wooden back, uh, a background with a wood, um, uh, with a forest. So you might have a good chance to find wood there or find something to hunt. Uh, while cards with a mountain background have a good chance to fox and um, and so on. And some cards even have specific symbols, like if a card with a forest has a symbol of a mammoth, you can be pretty sure that you would find a mammoth there. Um, so yeah, depending on, <laughs> depending on these backgrounds, you decide which card you want to pick, flips their chosen card, while the other two cards get back on top of the deck, and then you can decide how you handle what you encounter. Because sure, you might have gone to the wood to find some deer to hunt, but unfortunately you found a wolf that wants to hunt you. So now you have to rethink your whole plan. Um, and um, <clears throat> there's also the possibility, if it's cooperative, uh, that um, a lot of cards have an extra icon, which means instead of doing your card yourself, you can just help someone else with their card. Yeah? So for example, hunting a mammoth is a task that a player usually can't do themselves. So um, you as a group might decide, hey, you have a card with a mammoth on the background. So let's hunt this mammoth and we pick cards which likely let us help you. And then you flip it and say, yes, we can help you. Now we can hunt this uh, mammoth. And um yeah that's basically you do it until uh, every deck is depleted then comes the night phase where you do some upkeep all your humans have to be fed and uh, then you start a new day um you win if you uh completed uh basically five tasks um that can be very different things it can be hunting mammoths it can be constructing um, something as, uh, c um, like Stonehenge, uh, whatever. Basically just five tasks that further your civilization um, or um, yeah, not, not all, um, or um, yeah, not, not all, or you lose <laughs> if you failed five times at something important. For example, feeding a human. If a human doesn't get fed, they uh, don't feel good. Um, also, if a human dies from a wet, they uh, don't feel good. Um, also, if a human dies from a wolf attack, um, these are things that uh, let you collect skulls. And if you have five skulls, you lose. Um, yeah. Um, it at first uh, this game I, it looked pretty overwhelming i have to admit because you have a lot of different card decks um, but once you get into it you realize it's actually pretty simple because these different card decks basically you have five different decks of cards you have your standard cards which you visit you have so, or, or vision cards um, that um, can be added to your regular deck and often give you some uh, bonus. You have your human cards and um, you have another card type, which I just forget. Oh yeah, your secret cards. Uh, basically things you might 
the why does it seem like there's a lot more because you have different modules um, the game is constructed so that you have with your card decks you have the basic cards that are used every time and then you add modules in um, the manual comes with predetermined used every time and then you add modules in um, the manual comes with predetermined levels for example for the first level you take module a and module b you take these cards out shuffle them into the respective decks and play this means one big downside i encountered especially and play this means one big downside i encountered especially when also playing it with students in school it is a lot to set up and tear down because when setting up you have to um, add in the modules you have to check okay where do i add the different cards um, and when you pack it away you have to go through every day thing in every single deck and see okay where do the cards belong um, so um, especially since the deck can change for example you can find a secret card that gets uh, shuffled into something or you file, get a vision and add the vision card to the regular deck and all this has to be uh, um, taken apart again after the game um, yeah so I've played it a couple times uh, solo, I've played it with others, and I have to say it works well in both ways. Um, uh, I first played it solo and had actually three tries until on the fourth try I actually won the first level um, because I am just bad at games. Um, <laughs> it took us two times. <laughs> um, Easy game. Yeah. Yeah, well, though I have to say, once you get the hang of it, it becomes a lot easier. So um, after I played the first level four times, um, I played it with students and we won immediately. And that's probably to a big part because I gave tips like should uh, take care of that. And uh, um, so I guided them a little because they were very insecure and um, the game specifically encourages you to only play with three people the first time um, because with four people there's just t too much to uh, keep in mind and look around look out for um, if you are not familiar with the game um, but yeah once you get the hang of it it's a really nice flow it's pretty simple um, it becomes very natural everything so yeah I'm yeah. going to say something um, which is a bit general about uh, co-op games but uh, in my personal opinion, games often really depend. Well, your success will easily depend on the draw, the order that the cards come in, and that stands true for people. In my opinion. Yeah, I, though I do think um, there is a certain amount of uh, mitigation in the game. Um, like you don't top card every time you pick up the three top cards and choose one of those. Uh, of course, there are situations when you pick up the three cards and you see, okay, all three of them are danger cards. So likely all three of them are really bad right now and we can't afford such a card. So there are these situations, but um, most of it felt like whatever you draw, there is a way for you to handle it. Um, and um, I mean, it's not like the game has... Uh, included some type of roll a 10 sided die and on a one you lose um <laughs> so <laughs> and um it's placed pretty quick um the box says uh, 45 to 60 minutes and i think that's uh, mostly accurate so um it's no trouble to you know start a level and oh you failed well try again and the great thing is if you try again uh, of what you can expect yeah so um for example, after my first game, uh, when I lost the first time, I realized, okay, I need to get more food, definitely. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, one major criticism that has been voiced the uh, first edition, um, but has been addressed with the second edition is diversity. Um, I mentioned earlier with Mammoths and when is the game actually settled, um, there is a great video by Shut Up and Sit Down um, where um, Quince explains it. Um, basically, 
all the characters in the first edition of the game are white and five of the 20 humans have red hair. And uh, the specific genes um, for red hair and uh, for being white became dominant way after the mammoths died out. So um, there, there is a, a reasonable um, complaint that this doesn't fit the setting. You know? Why aren't there people of color in it? And um, they have addressed it uh, in the second edition. There is a lot of vari variation uh, with skin tones. Um, there are a lot of um, people of color. I, I'm just looking at it. I don't think there are any any redheads <laughs> uh, in the second edition. And uh, there is an expansion um, which has not been released in English yet. Um, which has not been released in English yet. Um, it's called a new beginning, and um, there as well the characters are very diverse. So um, yeah, that's great that the uh, designers uh, acknowledge this problem, and uh, yeah, that's great that the uh, designers uh, acknowledge this problem and uh, changed it. Yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, Quince put it forward in a very good, mature, and um, open to discussion kind of fashion. And yeah, the people behind this game responsible. They said, uh, "Whoops!" and they apologized for it. And they said, "We can't correct it now, but we can correct it going ahead." And they have they have done. And representation matters. You know, it, it really does matter. And it's it's great to have something like this happen and it end very positively. Mm -hmm. And I have to admit, in parts, it gives a much more authentic and um, so so feeling uh, that yeah, this is actually like a tribe um, of of diverse people that face uh, the wilderness. Then this whole yeah, everything is white and the theme of the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really like Paleo. Um very impressed with it in particular i like how inviting it is on the table it's got that little tool rack and all the different boards where you keep all the cards and and it's got a nice all the cards and and it's got a nice bright kind of warm art style mm -hmm. which is a little cartoonish but kind of semi-ish realistic as well uh so it's something you can put out and people go "Ooh, okay yeah i'm interested in playing this and I really like the 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 deck of cards, the 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 deck of cards with the various events with the the card backs. Um, I think more games should be experimenting with having the card backs give you hints of what's coming. Uh, and I, when I when I play this, it's it's great. You you don't know for sure, but you can make an educated guess of like which one of the educated guess of like which one of these do I want to deal with? Which one do I really not want to deal with? Sometimes you're pushed into difficult decisions, but you're you're still making a decision rather than just I'll draw this card. What happens? Mm -hmm. um, which is part of the reason I was really excited about the Monster Hunter Kickstarter is they. They do the same thing in that they're providing a bit. Doing the same thing in that they're providing a bit of information on the card back, yeah. um, so you can try it. You can learn what the deck's doing, what's happening, and then make a, an educated, judgment-based decision on which what you're going to deal with. And and sometimes you're wrong. Some it's not like oh it's a cave it's going to be fine. It's like no like oh it's a cave it's going to be fine. It's like no sometimes that cave is occupied. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's it's enjoyable. I also really like the mechanic for assisting, where you can just be like, oh, um, I'll just help you with yours, which is very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I mean, there I, is a certain danger. So, um, I mean, there I, is a certain danger with this mechanic of uh, alpha gaming. Um, uh, that's what I noticed with my students. Uh, as I said, I gave a lot of tips, and at some point I noticed, okay, this uh, one student of me, she. Uh, basically all the time just helped everyone so uh, then I also be one so uh, then I also took a little bit more more care to check okay what do you have as cards hey let's pick this and we help you and so so she gets a more active role um, so that's definitely something to look out for um, 
that uh, someone doesn't get delegated hey you just help everyone else roll i have to say was a bit not exactly confused but uh meh after my first game about the tools rack um I, I like the idea of it being there to give you, uh, let's say, extra points, the logos that you that you will need. Um, but uh, maybe it's the it's just because it was the first uh, scenario or how uh, we played it. But uh, with I personally didn't get to feel uh, a real importance in the rack and the tools. We didn't get many more. Uh, tools and uh, I think maybe that's just because the first module doesn't uh, get too much into it but uh, if that's the case I would have maybe again that's for me I've preferred not to have this bonus and that the first that into account and to introduce it later on another module to have it a bit less overwhelming but that's that might be just personal preference I mean, uh, how much is added to this tool rack depends greatly on your choices. Um, I do agree, I did have with the first level um, place like maybe one or maybe two cards got added and there are six slots. Um, but with my students, actually, we had four cards in it. Um, so, I mean, usually when you uh, like rest, you have uh, the choice to either craft something or find a new idea. That cadet. So, um, but yeah, there is at least uh, in the first level not much incentive to do it because you have a lot of other ways to uh, complete your uh, painting to win the game. And the, the, this thing doesn't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it doesn't. Yeah, so well. and and taking it apart every time is ah, it doesn't feel good. So um, oh, I put it on a shelf with the uh, Everdell tree. It's actually a good idea. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can gather dust instead of uh, get worn apart by dismantling it. Right. Um, well, that's that's Paleo, which uh, I I I very much enjoy. I think it's pretty good. Um, but it's time to swap our case for castles and look at some Frankish worker placement with Shem Phillips, Architects of the West Kingdom. Uh, in the previous episode, I talked about the whole North Sea trilogy in one, basically because I was like, I like Raiders of the North Sea and the other two, uh, they're, they're fine, but they're not great. I started trying to do this for the West Kingdom trilogy. And I was like, I can't. I, I just can't do it because each game is great and there's just too much. So if I was trying to talk about so if I was trying to talk about all three of them in one go, I'd end up be talking for an hour and nobody needs to hear that at all. Least of all me. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about Architects of the West Kingdom and the little bit that Tome Saga does to it. So it is a worker placement game. Uh, a worker placement game. Uh, set in the uh, ooh, I've, I've got that thing it's the Carolingian Empire um, and you're royal architects and you're looking to impress the king and maintain your noble status as a consequence by building landmarks for in the landmarks for in this in this domain um, you're going to gather materials by placing workers hire apprentices who are cards that will give you uh, skills to let you build buildings or maybe bonuses to locations um, and uh, help build the cathedral as well and so it as well um, so it's it's kind of that classic point salad worker placement sort of game, but there's some nice twists that I really enjoy. So first of all, um, you can either play with a character, everyone has the same character, or you can play variable character powers. They just change things ever so slightly, like one character ignores taxes, and character ignores taxes, and other characters allow six um, apprentices instead of the normal five. It's a nice little twist um, when you're playing more to add a bit of variety. The board itself uh, is a little different to normal worker placement games. You've still got the old classic, put your worker here and do the thing, but and do the thing. But some of the spaces, only one worker can go in and then they're stuck there until the black market refreshes, in which case they all get told off for being naughty people and chucked in prison. 
or there's they go to the guild hall when you build buildings and they're, they're stuck there you can't get them out again um which it um which it means you're gradually diminishing workforce through the game or most of the spaces are, are large circles and any number of workers can go in there from any number of players now what's neat is say i'll go to the mine i want I, one worker will get me some clay nice he stays there and the next and the next time i place a worker there i can get two clay one for each worker or i can use both workers to get a piece of gold and then it goes on and on so three will give more and four and so on uh, so you're rewarded for investing into the same location and everyone else is looking to do this as well looking to do this as well because it's better and more efficient to be jumping in and like hey i'm going to keep gathering wood i get one wood two wood three wood four wood oh great i've got like more than 10 wood in four turns fantastic but the king doesn't really like everyone gathering in large groups he gets a bit concerned about maybe they start talking about the wrong, maybe they start talking about the wrong thing such as why do we need royalty anyway what's the point um, so you can also, uh, and they get stuck on the board. So you could also go to the town center and pay tax, which is like one coin to a little tax pool. The tax pool works. Tax pool. The tax pool works like the way people play um, uh, free parking in Monopoly, which they're not supposed to do. You know, it kind of pile, it piles up there, and then someone can go over and take it all. Um, but you pay your tax, and then you can pick a group of uh, workers from one player in an area and capture them all if you capture your own workers they go back to your pool. your own workers they go back to your pool so you can put them back on the board again and maybe you change your focus of where you're doing stuff but if you capture somebody else's they go into a little capture pen on your board and then in a later turn you can take one of your workers put them over by the prison dump all of those workers into prison and get paid a bounty for it so there's a little in that you can go oh you're doing too much wood cutting you, you, that's far too efficient i'm going to stop stop that stop that and you run in and capture their five workers and next to and chuck them in prison the person who's had them thrown in can just go over to prison place a worker and go right get everyone out so you slow them down a bit but you also help them recycle their workers onto them and then at the end of the round everybody picks their workers back up again instead they kind of accumulate and flow around in a different way to normal which i find neat then uh, the other elements of the game are the buildings you're making you'll start with three building cards um, they require skills on play them you might get them either an immediate bonus um, like some free money or gold or perhaps an immediate capture on someone's uh, pawns or maybe your virtue will go up or down and it'll be worth points at the end of the game or instead of doing that you can go to the guild hall and go to the guild hall uh, place your worker and you can discard the card and pay some other things to help build the church and the church will give you a reward card and it's worth a lot of points the more work you put into the church like in the first first build for each player is two points but the fifth and final builds 20 points final builds 20 points so it's quite quite a significant investment but it's also big rewards and um it, it, it's uh it's very interesting how it all flows around and on top of that they've they've layered in this um this virtue track where your virtue track where your character will start with a certain amount of virtue is how good their reputation is and if you do illegal activities like you go to send someone to the black market and pay a little bit of money to get some very good rare goods and uh, um, resources or even maybe a cheap apprentice uh then you'll also uh then you'll also lose some virtue and if your virtue goes too low you're not allowed to work on the cathedral because you're you're disre you know you're disre disre you're disrespectful no you're disreputable no my pronunciation's gone here you're a ruffian <laughs> you're a ruffian you're a terrible criminal and you should know better there's hey you can build in the church but you can't go to the black market because they'll look at you and go no 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 this person will just knock us They'll just chuck us into the to, to the bailiff and we'll get locked up. So that's fun in that you can be, oh, I'm going to be super virtuous or I'm going to just, I'm going to take the easy route and deal with the, the penalties of being a criminal. Uh, so, or you can even dance in the middle. It's it's cool that you've got all of these options, um, which 
uh, now I'm saying it, it's like, yeah, a lot of worker placement games like to do that kind of stuff as well. But there's something really satisfying about the flow of this one. I think it's it's the way that everything clicks together and suddenly somebody steps in, captures some of your workers and your engine falls apart and you go, OK, well, I'm going to have to maybe change track or even better, if you're smart, you can kind of get somebody to capture your workers at exactly the moment you want them to. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I'm not that smart either. <laughs> I'm not that smart either, but sometimes it just happens. Somebody goes, "Ah, oh, I'm going to capture those 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 guys you've got over at the quarry," and you go, "Okay." Oh, that's good. That's good. I I was done. I've got all the stone I need. Fantastic. I'll go. I'll I'll go get them out of prison in a turn or two. Brilliant. Cheers. Um. So that's kind of neat. So that's kind of neat. There's an expansion, uh, Age of Architects, which lets you give tools to your apprentices. Um. The mechanism's interesting, it's a bit weird, uh, in that in order to do it, you have to have built a building and then you take one of your workers and lie them on top of the existing work in the guild hall, in the guild hall, and then you get a tool. Um, I'm not really sure what they're doing in the guild hall that produces a tool that requires them to lie on top of each other, but it, it looks weird. It makes me laugh every time I do it. Uh, you can also do um, adornments instead of tools. They sit on top of a building. You, they sit on top of a building you've already made and give you like some extra bonuses. So uh, it's a nice small expansion that doesn't it doesn't do too much extra. You don't really need it, but it feels good when you play with it. So yeah, uh, the bit I would say is most interesting for me is this game. Come interesting for me is this game comes one to four players. Uh, the solo mode is pretty good. There's a, a nice solo bot that does a good job of mimicking a human player. It keeps you in check. It, it captures your workers when they're getting out of hand. Um, and it feels great. You can even play, and it feels great. You can even play it as a two player co-op bot and it's fantastic there. Um, but also in Tome Saga, they have another one, a cooperative bot that scales up to six players because the game can run up to six players with the expansion. And he is mean. He's like, it's like, he's like, it's like playing, uh, trying to be in Nottingham with the chef, chef of Nottingham, just oppressing everything you do. He's constantly chucking all of your workers into prison and taxing things and all sorts. He's, he, he sucks. And it's interesting how these like four different ways of playing have created quite a different experience, quite a different experience each time for me. Um, I felt like I felt freer when playing against the solo bot that came in the game uh, than playing in the co-op uh, bot from Tome Saga. It was like, oh, this guy is, he sucks. I hate him. I hate his stupid face. I hate his stupid face. I hate that he's best friends with the king. It's it's awful. So uh, I, I really love this game a great deal. Um, I'm probably going to come back and talk about paladins and vice counts at some time in the future um because they're both interesting paladins has a uh, paladins has a uh, worker drafting system where you draft workers from choices and place them um and then vice counts is a rondel game with a really cool looking plastic castle in the middle that uh, you you walk round and round um but I can't give them justice in the time that we've got here. Give them justice in the time that we've got here. So that's mostly it. Um, I I don't know if you guys have played any of Shem Phillips' games at all. I want to, but I've never had the opportunity to. And there are so many games that uh, I wouldn't know uh, which one would fit me most. I've heard good about of the city, I think they called it now. Uh, which is the reboot of the Raiders of the North Sea with an extra module added into it. Mm. Um, I, yeah. For the convenience of having the, the bundle. But I'm not sure if it's a game that I would love or like, so I don't know. Tough. Um, I would say uh, Raiders of the North Sea is very good. Like, I thoroughly recommend that if you of, of the North Sea one. But I talked about that in the previous episode. Explorers of the North Sea. No, Explorers of the North Sea uh, is a pick up and deliver. So that's, I, I, I don't like that one as much. I don't like that one as much. Of the West Kingdom series, this is the first one. And it's definitely 
the the one that I found easiest to get into. So that I would recommend either Raiders of the North Sea or Architects of the West Kingdom to start with, but you couldn't go wrong with Paladins of the West Kingdom either. Of the West Kingdom either. So Ra Raiders of City, Citya, which is the, the reboot. Oh yes, that's the the yes, that's the the self-contained, um, yes, redo. That's also or Paladins or Architects. Yes, yeah, any of those. Huh. Yeah, I, I, there are so many. <laughs> Very excited about that. The photos just came out recently, and the board looks very different to everything he's done previously. I mean, I know I, I stumbled across um, these games before, and I at first I thought, hey, this looks interesting, and then actually I was really confused and overwhelmed because, okay, wait, there are like three games with West Kingdom, and how does it fit together? And is it like part one, part two, part three, or is it expanded? And, it just uh, it got too much for me, so I decided <laughs> to to skip them. Um, but yes, um, this Architects of the West Kingdom sounds really interesting. It is. Um, the North of the West Kingdom sounds really interesting. It is. Um, the North Sea trilogy is like completely unrelated to the West Kingdom trilogy. Um, each game's perfectly fine on its own as well. Uh, they just they do a thing ca called like a, a saga. Uh, it's Rune Saga for the first trilogy. Saga. Uh, it's Rune Saga for the first trilogy. It's Tome Saga for the West Kingdom, and it gives you like a way to play each of the three games one after another as a, like a running contest. Um, and also in the case of West Kingdom, it gives each of the games a co-op mode to play in. But all of the games have a solo mode in the West Kingdom games is like my highest recommendation. Um, Raiders of Scythia is very good as well uh, for if you want an entirely standalone game just to see if you like the way Shem Phillips designed stuff. I would probably go for Raiders of Scythia to, for the idea of yeah entire standalone stuff, uh, but that's me. Yeah, I have no reason to get it because it's so close to Raiders of the North Sea that I'd just be buying the same game again. Yeah, that's what I heard. Yeah, so that's that's kind of it. That's my my big recommendation. Um, but uh, I I do I do think Paladins is particularly wonderful as well. Uh, it's it's more because Architect still does do a lot of the classic worker placement kind of stuff, whereas Paladins really switches it up. It's still a worker placement game, but it doesn't feel like anyone I've ever played anywhere else. A bit like how Everdell feels completely unique as a worker placement game. You know, it's not quite a worker placement game. It's doing something di quite a worker placement game. It's doing something different with the mechanics. Yeah, I, I, I think I get it. Oh yeah, and there's, oh, of course, there's um, uh, Hadrian's Wall, which is not from Shem, but it's Garfield Games as well, and that is people really rave about that as a solo game. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, so that is um, Architects of the West Kingdom, and a little bit more about the West Kingdom trilogy as a whole uh, gets two thumbs up from me for definite um an interrogation uh, so point much so that... from me <laughs> yes it's it, I, so much so that i'm looking at my box now and i'm sad that i dropped it now and i'm sad that i dropped it and bust the side of it oh, no. it's uh yeah yeah to tape it back together i'm hoping they will release a big box to to, to, that I can replace it, but otherwise it's just going to have to go on the shelf and deal with being a bit damaged. Yeah, at least but, it can um, be with the elf. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, anyway, let's not talk about the damaged boxes I have in my collection, because <laughs> otherwise we'd be talking about Newton, um, which is in a real state. Uh, instead, thank you very much for listening to The Last Dandy and putting up with my dithering. You can catch us over at WW Podcast App Flavor. It's goodbye from Audrey. Bye bye. Kara. Auf Wiederhören. And myself. And remember, the second E in Standy is for Electro. Electro.